Hello, Jordi Shell here, and we're at the Makeup Artist Trade Show 2003. I'm sitting here with Dick Smith, uh, the legend of makeup, and I'm going to uh, conduct an informal interview with him here. Dick, uh, for those that aren't familiar with your background, could you tell us a little bit about how you got your start? I was a freshman student at Yale, and I found on sale in the Yale Co-op bookstore a book on stage makeup. I learned years later, it was one of the most awful makeup books ever, but I didn't know the difference. And so when I was at Yale, I decided to play around with makeup in my spare time. And I did that for a couple of years before the war got serious. And uh, I would make myself up as one of the old uh, universal monsters. I went through Jekyll and Hyde, Hunchback of Notre Dame, Frankenstein, of course. I went to a movie all dressed up as Frankenstein with built up boots. In the meantime, I was taking a pre-med because I thought I'd be a dentist. Well, because of the war and the fact that life was very uncertain, I did, had no idea whether I'd survive it. And I thought, God, I love this stuff. This is such fun. I was a kind of kid that was a, uh, never, never went in for sports. I was always indoors making model airplanes and things like that. Anyway, I decided whatever that happened, when I got out of the army, I was going to try to get into makeup. And when I got out, it turned out it wasn't that easy. I sent pictures of stuff that I'd done to Hollywood studios. and uh, Nice things were said, but no job. And then my father said, you know, there's this thing called television. It took about six months of trying, and I finally landed that job at NBC. Literally, I was the first staff makeup artist. My wonderful pay was $50 a week, but I was glad to get it. I was so lucky. I came along at the right time in the right place. And it didn't matter I didn't know anything because television was just starting. Nobody in television knew anything. And I had to learn pretty fast because it grew. It was from one little radio studio. Five years later, I had a staff of 20 full-time makeup artists, all of whom I had to teach. I was at NBC from 45 to 59. And then I left NBC and joined uh, a producer named David Suskind, who did a lot of television drama for two more years. And then all drama in television came to an end, really, because game shows came in. Suskind, in defense, went into films. And the first film he made, he had made a TV production of, of Requiem for a Heavyweight with Jack, Jack Palance, which was quite a success. But now he went in to making a film, and he cast Anthony Quinn. And I just went with him. That first film, I had to make Tony Quinn look like a beaten up old prize fighter. I have to tell you a funny story. Uh, Cassius Clay was cast as the young opponent who beats the hell out of him in one of the first scenes. We shot this in a stadium way up in the Bronx or something, New York, in the middle of winter, freezing, no heat. And so before every take in this prize fight they were shooting, I had to climb into the ring with a spray bottle and spritz them to make them look sweaty. Well, even if you boil the water, it comes out freezing. It's torture. Quinn would stand there stoically, not uttering a sound while I sprayed him. But when I went for Cassius, you remember what a crazy kid he was, yelling and hollering and whooping and all that sort of stuff. Well, he wouldn't let me I try to get near him in the ring. He'd run away. And here, imagine, here I am, chasing Cassius Clay around a prize fight. <laughs> and he never lays a blow on me. <laughs> I wish I had a picture of that. <laughs> I would eventually catch up with him and spray him, but it took quite a few circles before, before I connected. <laughs> What's your opinion of some of the films you've worked on, particularly uh, the violence uh, that's been in a lot of the movies, such as Taxi Driver and The Hunger? I much prefer character makeup, though I'm known for kind of being against blood and gore. I, I would say about a third of the films I've done have involved some of that. There were some gory things in Ghost Story, with another thing I can't remember the name of, which is really, I have had someone stabbed through the eye, and the Sentinel, the Sentinel, that was, that was really blood and gore. I didn't really want to do that. I remember I took on the Deer Hunter uh, with the promise by the director that the script, he wasn't going to follow all the gore indicated in the script in the war scenes. Oh, no, no, he was going to soft pedal that. No burning babies, nothing like that. Well, I get over there with practically nothing but, you know, a little blood and stuff. 
and I find I have to do wounds all galore all over the place. And all I had to do, <laughs> I only had some blood, some blood gel paste and some and uh, tissue paper. <laughs> yes, I prefer to do transformation. I get a great thrill out of doing a makeup that normally takes three or four hours to apply. Of course, as you put on the appliances, which have only maybe, maybe a light flesh tone uh, and don't look realistic at all when you glue them on, uh, then you get to the stage where, of course, you're starting to put on a a base flesh tone of some sort. And it blends it in with the bare spots on the face. And then you put more colors. And there's a point where you lose the identity of the actor. And the new identity, which you have created, begins to come to life. And that's an emotional moment that I call the Dr. Frankenstein effect. Because we all remember the great scenes where the monster comes alive. And Colin, I think it was Colin Clive, the actor, practically screams, it's alive, it's alive. And I, I feel that, I feel I've created, I've created a living identity, a, 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 a human being, a different human being that, that is mine, uh, my work, my art, artistry, whatever it is. And, and, the, and then when the actor puts his interpretation, his life into it, with his performance. It's truly so alive that I have found that even when the makeup is removed at the end of the day or the end of the show, that the identity, like a person who's died, or like a person who's just gone away, is still there. It's like that, that person had a brief life that was a real life and that is so strong that you think of it as a person who lived. Now, one of the things that I notice in uh, the creatures and stuff that you've done for films is that your design ethic is different from any other makeup effects artist uh, in the business. I'm wondering where you get your inspiration from, where you come up with your ideas for creature designs, because they are so, so different from the other stuff that I've ever seen. Well, I'll give you an example on The Exorcist, which was certainly as big a challenge as one could face, I think, in, in that department. Uh, since it wasn't, you know, wild, it had, to be, it had to be my favorite word, believable. I always look for research. I always look for pictures to inspire me. And so I went back through um, anything I could find that was bizarre. I have saved extensive reference in pictures that I've cut out of magazines and you know they cover everything that I can think of that could relate to makeup historical characters uh, animals uh, bizarre things uh, you know anything I think might have some use and so I comb my files and I remember searching for inspiration for the exorcist it was very difficult to find anything that was applicable I did a, uh, a way out TV series in which I used a combination of some leonine type leprosy with an eye disease that I found in a medical book where the whole eyeball tends to be pushed out of the socket, horribly nasty. And uh, so I incorporated, incorporated that into this makeup. So there are some, sometimes I can find something that l almost literally I can, I can copy. I'm not terribly imaginative. I haven't got your gifts for uh, all kinds of you know, bizarre distortions and, and, and creatures that seem to just come to you. Uh, I have no idea where you would get any reference for those things. That has been my main tool, is, is, is reference. It may be even a tiny thing that I find, but it's enough to kind of give me a start. Now, you've worked on some of the most famous uh, and biggest films of all time. I'm curious what your personal favorite is? Without question, Amadeus, for several reasons. First of all, I only had to do one makeup, not a whole slew of things or effects or any other things besides that. I had to do this makeup on F. Murray Abraham, who was a very cooperative actor. They're not all, as you know. I had plenty of time to prepare. I could do it in my little basement studio where I did all my work, which if I had six people got too crowded. and all by myself. For the first time in years, I did everything. I, I, I could mix the plaster. I mean, the simplest thing, which was a great joy. It was like going back. 
uh, and, 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 and doing everything I'd learned, all in this one job. And in fact, in, in designing the makeup, again, I borrowed or I took from lessons I had learned and things I developed throughout the previous aging makeups that I'd had. Each one had problems, each one, there was maybe some little thing that I gained. And so I put them all into this. It was like a culmin culmination. And then they, they gave me carte blanche. There were no questions about even the money or the time. I think I spent a leisurely month and a half or so preparing it. Then I went over to Prague to do a screen test and everything went good except a couple little things to tweak. I had a week off or so. I think I didn't even have to go back to the States. I think I spent the week in London having fun. Came back and they put all the scenes when he's old all into about three weeks of shooting. So I wasn't sitting around, you know, twiddling my thumbs. I, I, I started the makeup like at 6 a.m. No one ever came in and said, when are you going to be done? The cinematographer and everyone uh, were wonderful and uh, supportive. Uh, they liked, everyone liked my makeup. Oh, I have to tell you one little story. The cinematographer, he had done another film, which shall be nameless, in which a famous makeup artist had done an aging makeup, which was pretty much a disaster. He came in when I was putting on the makeup for the first time and kind of, you know, said hello grumpily and uh, saw me doing the early stages. I learned what I'm about to tell you later from uh, the head gaffer, uh, Dickie Quinlan. The, the cinematographer came out and uh, uh, encountered uh, Dickie and said, oh, this is, this is, this is not going to work. This is, uh, I, I, I know these things. I know these things. This is, we're in trouble. And Dickie said, no, no, no. You wait. You wait and you see. Dick will pull it off. No, no, no. Anyway, he came back again a couple of times while I was doing the makeup, but he never came back towards the end when I got the color on, right? Well, I finally finished and walk him down the hall, and uh, the studio is way down this hall, and there's the cinematographer outside chatting with someone, and he sees us coming from a distance, and he's doing this kind of thing. He's looking, you know, staring from a distance, and we, we come, uh, 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 I'm following, and the minute he sees um, uh, F. Murray, he darts into the studio. And what he's doing, he's turning on the lights and getting ready. So when we walk in, immediately, the director immediately tells uh, F. Murray where to sit. They've got the, and now the, the uh, cinematographer is racing around, changing lights a little bit, checking and looking at him, looking in the camera, all that routine, uh, two or three minutes. And then he's finally ready, he turns and he signals to the director, and then he turns and he spots me on the sidelines, standing there with my kid, and he goes. That was great. <laughs> of course, Exorcist is naturally, I'm very proud of the Exorcist. I mean, I started special makeup effects with the Exorcist. I've created a whole era, a whole change in the whole business, in the profession. Uh, with the influence of that. So that's certainly a favorite. You know, and then invented so many things in that, and, and, and the makeups were good, and Max von Sydow was one of my best aging makeups at that point. And partly, a lot of that I give credit to Billy Freak and the director, because he was a slave driver. I mean, I, I did three complete screen tests on Max von Sydow's aging makeup, and Billy being not satisfied until it was uh, perfected. That was a learning experience, and it never happened any other time in my career that I had so many ways to refine a makeup. That was a joy. You've been considered something of a pioneer in terms of old age makeups. Specifically in the case of Little Big Man, there were all kinds of uh, innovations that you created to do that makeup. Can you talk a little about that and you know what, how you went about the process of designing and creating that makeup. A Little Big Man was a, a landmark in my career. It was a, a golden opportunity. One of these things that doesn't come along uh, many times in, in, a, in a lifetime or a career. To do this extreme old age makeup in 121, the oldest that had been done before was when I was a kid.